Welcome, and thanks for joining us. In June 2019, we hosted our Employee Engagement Council meeting focused on leveraging strengths in the workplace. And we had a huge response from our audience and from others across the Army, really wanting more information and to be able to share that section more broadly. So we've decided to do a podcast here today to share uh, with you all and a larger Army audience some of the great things that we discussed in regards to leveraging strengths in the workplace. Please feel free to pass this recording along and reach out to any of our presenters here today with any questions via email is on the last slide. Um, we're happy to continue the dialogue with you. I think this is a great way to continue that discussion that was started in June 2019 going forward because we think this is such an important topic. So I'll take a moment to in just introduce those of us that we have here in the room. So my name is Edward Emden. I'm the Civilian Workforce Transformation Integrator with the Army. Our main presenters today are Mel Kepler. Mel is a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach who spent 13 years working as a civilian in the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And Rachel Niebling. Rachel is a Certified Employee Engagement and Recognition Expert, currently working with the Civilian Workforce Transformation Team on Engagement and Human Capital Strategy Initiatives. Also with us for our discussion this morning is Jenny Higgs. She is part of our Civilian Workforce Transformation Support Team. And Jalen Gatling. Jalen is a member of the Employee Engagement Community of Practice. So we're looking forward to having uh, this group discussion together, and I will turn it over to Mel and Rachel to lead us through that. Thank you, Ed. All right, I'm Mel Kepler, and before we get started, before we even move into the slides here, I want to prepare you because this is going to be a different way of thinking, what most of us have experienced about how to think of ourselves, how to develop ourselves in the workplace. So prepare yourselves because it's going to be a little bit weird. All right, so let's look at this. Let's imagine that your child brings you this report card. And if that is beyond the suspension of disbelief that you can manage, if having a child over to bring you a report card with letter grades on it is like blowing your mind, imagine you brought this report card to your parents. Where would you anticipate that you'd spend the majority of your time discussing? Any takers? English, for sure. English. English. That big red D, right? It's even in red. So honestly, 70, about 70% of American parents agree that you spend the majority of the time talking about the D. And I want to point out two things here. Number one, this kid got A pluses. They nailed it in math, science, and history. That's three excellent grades. And also, I want to point out that D is not a failing grade. That D is not failing. It's not great. It's not great. It could be better, right? There's room for improvement, but it's not a failure. So why is it that we spend most of our time talking about the one thing you did poorly as opposed to the three things you did really well? Today, we're going to see if we can flip the script on this, if we can start talking about what did you do amazingly in math, science, and history? What are you great at? And how can we apply those ideas and those uh, concepts, those talents that you naturally have to English, maybe turn that D into something a little higher than that? So let's set the scene here. Let's pretend you're walking to your DP map conversation with your boss, and you're ready with your report card. <laughs> you had some great work this time around and you had one project that didn't go great, but you feel like you know what you went wrong, you're ready to move forward and talk about how you can do great work with your upcoming projects. So you come into your boss's office and you sit down and the entire conversation is focused around that one bad project. So what kind of reaction are you going to have? Is it going to go and inspire you to do your best work? Probably not. And this is an example of dysfunctional behavior. And research has shown that 28 to 36% of leaders engage in this type of behavior. And you know what? That stinks. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that stinks. And this is the stinky taxonomy. The stinky taxonomy was developed by Dr. Brad Shuck and his team at the University of Louisville. Dr. Shuck is recognized as one of the most knowledgeable experts on employee engagement. He and his team have conducted extensive research around how employee engagement happens in practice and how leaders can drive engagement. It was created as part of an integrative review exploring the consequences of dysfunctional leaders and the implications for the employees who work for them. The behaviors are charted according to their regularity and the disturbance that it causes to the employee. So let's pull out a few of these behaviors. Criticizes my work. Reminds me of my mistakes works below competency. Now, criticizes my work and reminds me of my mistakes. Um, of course, constructive criticism oh, and okay. accountability, important, but how many people are going to come around to your desk and remind you that the cover sheet is missing from your TPS report? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, work below competency. Sometimes we all have to do work that's mind-numbing or below our pay grade. In low frequency, it's tolerable, but when you reach it in high frequency, that's where you're risking disengagement and actually lower productivity. So if we take this back to the DT map conversation before criticizing your work, has your manager assessed whether this was a competency or a performance error? If Mel misspells, I don't know, engagement <laughs> in a PowerPoint presentation that is being recorded, we're going to assume that that's a performance error and that she does actually know how to spell engagement. I don't want to sit down with you and have spelling lessons about engagement. Like, can we assume that I'm a basic competent professional who knows how to spell and I screwed up? Absolutely. So wouldn't the conversation be more productive and engaging mm -hmm. if it were focused <laughs> on, on getting you matched up with the appropriate level of work? How can you change conversations to make sure that employees are focused at a higher level of competency, at the proper level of competency for their upcoming projects. So that's the basic idea here of strengths-based development. Don Clifton uh, is a psychologist uh, who formed the company that, that now does Clifton Strengths, which is where my training came from. And this quote from him is the basic idea behind all of strengths. What would happen if we stop fixating on what's wrong with people, what they screwed up, and start focusing on what's right with them, what they do well? What if, in that conversation with your boss, instead of focusing on your missing TPS report cover sheets and the fact that you misspelled engagement, what if your boss talked about how great you did at the other projects you did and then turned it around and then came back to talk about accountability and how to make sure you do the mind-numbing and below-competency work that you're required to do as part of your job? This is actually a different approach to what most of us, and me included, have ever experienced in the workplace. Over on the left here, we have the conventional approach to personal development. This is what we have mostly experienced. The key part here is that the idea, the way to eat success is to fix your weaknesses. We're just going to fix all the things that you're bad at. We're going to make you great at them, and then everything will be perfect forever, and no one will ever have problems again. It also includes the idea that the best people in a role all display the same behaviors. A lot of us have experienced this, where you get into a team, and everyone's like, hi, welcome to the team. This is Jenny. Jenny's perfect. Just be Jenny. Well, you're, you're not going to be Jenny, only Jenny's Jenny. And they were perfect. I do the missile engagement money. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Jenny is actually cornered the market on being Jenny, and the best you can do is be a poor copy. And the other thing in conventional approach to personal development is that most, if not all, behaviors can be learned. And that actually, I feel like a lot of us have learned to find that it's empowering, and that's the hardest thing for your people to accept when we go to, over on the right here, the strength-based approach to personal development. Only some behaviors can be learned. You can learn skills. You can gain knowledge. You can't change who you are. You are who you are. That's okay. We're going to move on, and we're going to figure out how to do that. But you are not going to be Jenny. Unless you're Jenny. Jenny, you can be Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that the best people in a role deliver the same outcome using completely different behaviors. Maybe one person uh, builds a to-do list and a process and just goes down it like the Terminator and checks things off and moves on to the next goal. And maybe another person thinks of the long-term goal and kind of floats gently toward it. Maybe one person sits down and does a bunch of research before they get started. Another person has already gotten up from their desk to go meet all the different people in all the different organizations that they think they're going to need for this project. As long as they get where they're going, as long as they achieve the outcome they need to do, that's okay. We're going to let people take their own path to the same outcome. The strength-based approach to personal development is that you should fix your weaknesses to prevent failure. Absolutely. We do not want that D to become an F. We are not saying just because you, you don't have empathy as a strength very high, that means you're allowed to go around hurting everybody's feelings and leaving broken employees in your wake like you're a steamroller. We're saying, you, you know, you, you got to be kind to people. You have to have some basic human capabilities here. But the only way to get to success is to build on your strengths. You can take your weaknesses from a negative 15 to a zero, but you can improve almost infinitely on things you're good at. So we're going to focus here today on what you're good at. Now, why? Because the numbers don't lie. Gallup did a meta-analysis report that they called it in 2015. They compiled client-sponsored studies, including 22 organizations, 1.2 million employees across more than 49,000 business units in seven different industries. And what they found when they looked at organizations that had a strengths-based workplace versus not strength-based. This is more than just taking an assessment and finding out the words that mean your strengths and then putting them in your desk drawer and moving on with your life. This is, I feel like I use my strengths. This is, my manager focuses on my strengths. This is, I use my strengths in my own goal setting and in my personal development. The people who said yes to those things 
were three times more likely to report having an excellent quality of life. They were six times more likely to be engaged at work. Six times, that's huge. They were more productive individually and on teams, and they were 15% less likely to quit their job. Now, one of the things we hear a lot when we work with our government clients is that, sure, things are easier to fix in the private sector because they have all this money, right? Money's just falling from the ceiling in the private sector. And in the government, we don't have money to solve our mm-hmm. problems. But turnover costs money. Turnover costs a ton of money. And what could we do if we had 15% lower turnover, if we could keep 15% of our people longer or, or get them to a different job that they liked better instead of having them leave and then having to replace them? That's money in the bank. That's money that we can keep and apply to other things. And that's not counting the intangibles over here on the left, like self-confidence, greater direction, greater hope, greater altruism. How much more mission could you accomplish with people having a stronger internal sense of direction and hope? So, Mel, do we know, did this study that you just quoted involve government employees as well? You know what? They don't actually specify whether government employees were involved or not, Ed, but Having worked in the government for many years, I can say with high confidence that government employees are human beings. And when you're talking about, I am 100% sure of that. I will put money down on that. That when you're talking about 1.2 million people and overall the number of people who have taken the strength assessment is 20 million worldwide. And when they find the same kinds of results across the world, across gender, across job roles, I am very confident in saying that the government and even specifically Army civilians are not different. They are human beings and they react to things in a human way. So there's no reason. There's no reason that it shouldn't apply to you. And in fact, we did, there are some other statistics about profitability or sales. And we took those off because we know that you don't care about sales. You're not worried about selling more tanks, whatever. You're not worried about selling. You're worried about things like how much can we get done? The, The Army is focused on mission. And so we tried to pick things that would speak to the ability to accomplish mission. So Peter Drucker coined the phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. (laughs) The military version of that, if you've heard it, is um, no plan to provide first contact with the enemy, which sometimes the enemy is reality. So all the information and statistics that Mal shared on the, the previous slide goes hand in hand with engagement. The reason that we had the higher productivity, the greater quality of life, Mm -hmm. is because there was six times more engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So here we have a couple of additional ones from Gallup as well. For example, we have 41% lower absenteeism when you have higher employee engagement. So absenteeism is the art of regularly staying away from work without a good reason. We're not talking about sick days. We're not talking about your kid is sick and your car broke down. We're talking about, I just can't. I just can't go back to that place. I need a day. Yeah, I need a day. I need a day. (laughs) Exactly. Right. And let's not pretend everyone hasn't felt that way, but we're talking about that happening less frequently. Yes. And 70% fewer safety incidents. And honestly, and let's, let's again, let's look at mission. This is, this, this slide says U.S. Army in the upper right-hand corner. When we're talking about safety incidents, we're not talking about regular white-collar mix-ups. We're talking about human life saved. If you do your work correctly, you're saving boots on the ground. You're saving people's lives. And speaking of unhealthy days, actively engaged employees have fewer unhealthy days per month. So on top of the lower absenteeism, there are also fewer days that employees are actually sick and out, or coming into work and practicing presenteeism, which is where you come into work, spread your germs everywhere, get everybody (laughs) else sick and lower the productivity, and then sit at your desk and play solitaire or do do less things, you know, your lower productivity is presenteeism. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I learned something today. I haven't heard that word before. Great. So we're saying here, it's, it's actually helpful not only for me, for me to be engaged, it's helpful for me for you to be engaged. Because right. I sit next to you, you're not getting me sick, you're not coming in and infecting me with your bad attitude, like I'm just here to collect a paycheck. It's helpful yeah. for me if my, my spouse or my partner is engaged. It's helpful Absolutely. for me. Disengagement is toxic. So now that we've seen why employee engagement matters and how strength matters at the employee level. Let's take it to the manager level for a moment. What we see on the right is what happens when supervisors focus on strengths. Employees are more engaged, full stop. Mm-hmm. On the left, we see some supporting statistics there that managers account for at least 70% of variance in employee engagement. Scores. <laughs> People whose managers involve them in goal setting are more likely to be engaged. Bad managers are costing the U.S. billions, with a B, with a B, of dollars a year. Yikes. 
And the most shocking for me was this bottom one, that 35% of U.S. workers said that they would willingly forgo a substantial pay raise to see their immediate supervisor fired. Not gone, not moved, fired. That's really interesting, and I think that also speaks to the classic government problem of not enough money. Like, first of all, $450 billion every year. Because what of the should we do with all that? What could we do with that amount of money? And finally, U.S. workers are telling us, 35% of them at least, they don't want more money. They want you to get rid of the guy that's stopping them from doing their job. They want him out, and that would be just as satisfying as that chunk of money that you can't give them. This is a zoom of the upper right quadrant of the stinky taxonomy. I call it the danger zone. <laughs> um, these behaviors are both traumatic and occur frequently in the workplace, according to Dr. Shuck's research. So things like impossible deadlines, breaking promises, taking ownership of ideas, and the number one traumatic behavior is ignoring my opinion. Ignoring my opinion. So everybody likes to be heard. They want to know that what they're saying matters. So if 30% of employees feel included in goal setting, which we saw in the previous slide. My question is, do 70% of employees feel like their opinion is being ignored when it comes to setting goals at work? Well, mathematically, absolutely, yes. But I think it's, I like that you explicitly tied ignoring my opinion to goal setting, because I could absolutely see a supervisor looking at this and being like, oh, it ignores my opinion. Everyone wants to have their own opinion. We'll just go in a million different directions. And I, as a manager, apparently have no right to set the strategic direction of my branch. That is not what we're saying at all. We're saying that there are ways and ways to listen to your employees. You can have them have a voice in their own goal setting in, for example, how they're getting to their goals. What are the methods? What things are they going to focus on? What are the small goals that reach to the big goals? What part of the large group goal do they have ownership of? And that's a way to have someone feel like their opinion is being heard, their voice is being heard, without taking your unit in a million different directions. So I really do think that goal setting is a place where you can really uh, hit home that you are listening to your employees. You are hearing their opinions. So we've, had, we've talked a lot in the last slide or so about some stinky behaviors that managers do, what some issues are regarding manager behavior and how they interact with their employees. I'm curious if you all have any thoughts on what drives that behavior on the part of the supervisors. Is it just that they're not using their strength appropriately or, or something else that might be behind why we see these behaviors? Well, in general, Ed, I like to assume that they're not evil, that no one is out there being like, what am I going to do today? Put on my tie and go ignore some opinions. <laughs> not a pointy-haired boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The majority of your bosses are not the pointy here Dilbert boss. But what they might be doing is it might be a misalignment of strengths. So, for example, you might have an employee who is now a manager who's very used to feeling like their, their responsibility is to do all the things themselves. And so then they move up and they fail to let go of the doing the things. They, and they end up trying to do the things using their employees as puppets. Microman Micromanaging, <laughs> right? That's everyone's favorite. Everybody loves that. That's the best. This is extremely sarcastic. So, that, I mean, that's one really common thing we have. And I don't believe that people are micro, who are micromanaging are trying to disengage their employees, but that is the effect. It's that they're, they're not looking at their own role, their current role that they're in, and how it aligns to the mission. And they're also not looking at what their people are good at. I would say some of it is also the way that they look at things through their mm -hmm. own strengths. They're not widening that lens. Yeah. And they're not, um, there's, so there's a difference between responsibility and accountability. Uh, responsibility is doing it yourself. Accountability is making sure it's done. That, I think, is, is one of the things that leads to micromanagement, is the failure to move from responsibility to accountability. But also, when we have employees who do things in a different way than what their supervisors are used to, and we are going back to the old school style of personal development where the best people all do things the same way, then what we end up with is very prescriptive behavior from supervisors where they end up trying to take someone and yank them around to become someone else instead of letting them do the thing the way they would naturally do it and focusing on the end goal. And in that case, we both have ignoring my opinion and excessive monitoring, mm -hmm. and, but we also have um, the employee feeling not seen and the supervisor expending a ton of extra effort to get to the same end goal and everyone's dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. So I answer the question. What I, what I think I'm coming around to is that there's got to be some sort of consideration of what the interaction of my skills are as the manager and your skills as the employee and that we find a way that leverages both of those instead of saying, you know, we're going to do it the way that works for me or the way that works for you. There's, Absolutely. And, and that's probably why a manager has to lead many different ways based yes. on the employees that he or she has. You nailed it.
A manager has to lead many different ways. However many people you directly supervise, that's how many different managerial styles you have to have. Sorry. So this is part of why small units are good. Let's go back to the statistic Rachel gave us that 70% of variance in employee engagement scores can be uh, attributed to the manager. So as a manager, I have the most direct impact on my employees' engagement. And I can either manage them all the exact same way or I can manage them in a way that actually works for them. And that gets the job done. That gets the job done. And either way, I can get the job done. But one way, my people will be engaged and we'll all be working together. It's like working with or against the wind, honestly. And I think that's a great tie-in to our previous employee engagement trainings, both about knowing your team. Each has their own kind of model. One more about our supervision and one more about accountability. But both a huge piece is knowing your team and understanding their motivations, their beliefs, how to reward them. And that helps you understand how they are, but also how they get the work done efficiently yeah. and have people feel valued, engaged, and ready for the next set of um, goals. Right. It's not an either or. Those things go together. You can know your team, have them feel heard and engaged, and get things done. And still manage them. Yes, yeah. okay. Absolutely. We'll do both. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. So we have said a lot of things about focusing on what you're good at, about managers focusing on what their teams are good at. But what we're saying here is not... You're bad at some stuff and that's okay and just be bad at it forever and we're not going to worry about it. Your talents, the things that you're naturally good at, and if you've taken the Clifton Strengths Assessment, that would be the words that you got when you finished the test. Those are talents. It's just naturally how you are, kind of the way you can't help but be. It doesn't become a strength, something you can count on to consistently provide impactful performance, something you can count on to pull yourself out of a bad situation or deliver the absolute best results. It doesn't become a strength until you invest in it. You have to practice it. You have to develop those skills. You have to build a knowledge base. You have to flex that muscle. And um, this is a hard thing. I, I think this kind of goes counter to what a lot of us are trained on. Like, for example, if you're naturally good at communication, you're probably not joining Toastmasters. If you're naturally good at data analysis, you're not taking advanced Tableau or Excel classes. You're leaving those things for the people who are bad at that. But like, honestly, flex it. Go to, the, go to Toastmasters if you're great at communication. Go to Tableau training if you're really great at analysis. Flex it. Learn how to do it better. Be the absolute best. Knock it out of the park. So you have a responsibility to take the things you're naturally good at and turn them into basically superpowers. You can't be, we said earlier, you are who you are. You're not going to be someone else. Be all that you can be, which some of you may be familiar with. <laughs> be yourself. You don't have to be a different person to be successful. Gallup has done a lot of research on this. Again, 20 million people have taken their assessment, and they have found zero correlation, zero correlation between any strength or set of strengths and any specific work role or level of success, or there's no magic formula of strengths to be a salesperson or to be a CEO or to be a senior executive. There's no formula. You are who you are, and you don't have to be someone else to be successful. You can be successful with what you are. Any person you think of, if you think of someone whose success you admire, Think hard. That person is not working with what they're bad at. Oprah is not a naturally bad communicator, right? <laughs> Eddie Van Halen does not stink at guitar. He got, they got famous, they got great, they got successful doing what they're great at. And they practiced it and they got better. And they invested in that and they turned it from a talent into a strength. Second point here, you don't have to be all things to all people. That well-rounded person that everyone wants you to be, that person is a myth. Let's let that go right now. You don't have to be everything to everyone. That's why there are other humans. You can't be anything you want to be, but you can do anything you want to do with who you are. You can be more of who you are. And finally, if you can't be anything but you want to be, if you can't be anything but yourself, if you don't have to become a different person, why wouldn't you want to learn to be a better version of yourself? Why wouldn't you want to be the best possible you that you can be? This is a responsibility that you have. Once you know who you are, you've got to get better at that. You've got to learn to be the best possible you. So with that in mind, um, what are some ways to be better at being yourself and increase your strengths? Okay, so one thing I would do is look for courses, look for training. Um, let yourself, for once, look at the training that you think you'd be really good at. And uh, don't give yourself the intro version. Give, put yourself in the advanced class. I feel like a lot of times when we seek out training, especially in the workplace, we seek out training to counter our weaknesses. Let yourself look into the other part of it. If you're super good at strategy, look into strategy. Like, search on the word strategy and see what your, your company offers, see what your organization offers. Go online, go to lynda.com, go to uh, other online sources and find free courses. Practice it. When you are offering other people, when you, uh, let's say you're really good at research, you really enjoy doing research, 
tell the people around you that you're good at doing research. Hey, you know what really is my jam? I love doing research and making a spreadsheet that helps you understand all the data. Can I do that for you? Or if you really like going out and meeting new people, offer it to the people around you. I really get a kick out of meeting new people. Would you be okay if I'm part of your meet and greet? So offer it to other people, look for distinctive training, and learn how to phrase what you're good at to your manager especially. Make sure they know what you are, who you are, and what you want to be. I how to advocate for yourself. How to advocate for yourself. That's part of this. Part of um, the Gallup model is making sure that you can name what you're good at and claim it for yourself and then advocate for yourself. Mm-hmm. And integrate into your goals. So that's absolutely. absolutely. You know, a goal for you to reach if you integrate it. Absolutely. So I like that too. So look at what you want to do. What do I want to do this year? Everyone has their performance plan. What do I need to accomplish this year? And then think about the how. The how is where you can really flex your strengths. So and my goal for the end of this year is to make sure I schedule all of the meetings, like 98% of the meetings within two days of being given the task by my boss. How am I going to do that? Am I a really deep research person? So I'm going to develop a plan and a structure and I'm going to run it by my boss and be like, this is the process. This is how I'm going to do it exactly right. Am I a social person where I'm going to sit down with my boss and learn all her ins and outs and understand her deeply as a human being so that I can schedule it exactly right the first time? It depends. The how is really where you're going to be able to flex what you're good at. Thank you. Okay. These words at the bottom of the screen here are the Gallup terms for the different strengths that they've named. 34 of them, and they've put them into four different domains. Executing strengths are strengths that you use to get things done. Influencing strengths are the strengths used to make sure people's voices are heard and that everyone has a voice in the process. Relationship building strengths are, as you might have imagined, strengths used to build relationships. And strategic thinking strengths help make sure you make good decisions. Now, I'm not technically wild about the domains because I feel like the very first thing people do with them is go, oh, I have no executing strengths. I can't get anything done. Or like, oh my God, I only have strategic thinking strengths. I'm a robot, which is absolutely not true because these boundaries are very fluid. For example, responsibility is an executing strength. People use it to get stuff done. Responsibility is a psychological obligation to do the things you said you were going to do. That is someone you can count on. But it's also used for relationship building because that is someone you can count on to do the things that they said they were going to do. That builds trust. And that helps people build those relationships with you. I want to specifically call attention to winning others over at the bottom of the influencing column because that's often abbreviated to woo. I have woo. I have my top five. It's my number five. And it's, you know, the ability to make friends quickly and to go out, make, make strange people likely, and then in my case, disappear quietly into the night. Not so quietly. Disappear loudly into the night. <laughs> um, but what I want to point out here is the top here. The chance of two people having the same top five strengths as defined by Gallup in these words in the same order, is one in 33 million. That is three times less likely than that you will be killed by a piece of an aircraft falling from the sky. It's not going to happen. There are people in the world with your same top five strengths, they don't work here. It's just you. You're you, and the odds that you would be you are just phenomenally small. So why on earth would we waste time and energy trying to turn you into someone else? And the, the link at the bottom of the slide, so that is where you can find the definition. Thank you so much. All of those terms? Yes, absolutely. So you can go in there. You can search by domains, which is why we split them into domains on the slide. And you can pull up, for example, if you want to know more about a ranger. You can read a quick paragraph about the general arranger theme and how Gallup defines it. My term for a ranger is MacGyver. A ranger works with what, what is right here in front of us that we can actually use right now. So let's say you haven't taken the assessment. You haven't taken the Gallup assessment. How on earth do I know what my strengths are? What do I do? Well, first of all, I want you to look at these things in yourself. What things do you pick up easily? What things do you not have to read the instruction manual and you just kind of have a gut feeling? You just know how you're going to do this part of the process or this whole thing. If you just kind of know how you're going to do it, that's a sign for you that you're working in your strengths. What thing do you yearn for? What do you absolutely definitely want to do? I want to be the one who's going to build the process that we're going to use to create this new system. Or I'm going to be the one who does the research. I'm going to make a spreadsheet. <laughs> I'm going to be the one who I absolutely have to be the one who goes out and meets the clients. I, I, I have to do it. That's the thing I want. Whatever you're drawn to is a sign you're working in your strengths. Flow, that sense of timelessness. That thing where you look up and it's two o'clock and you forgot to eat lunch. What were you doing? Because there's a very strong chance that it was within one of your strengths because that loss of time. The day where you got a ton done and you have no idea how that happened, you were probably working inside your strength. 
those glimpses of excellence. When people come up to you and they say, hey, Jenny, Rachel told me that I should come talk to you about how to build a process because you're really good at it. That's a sign that you're working in your strength. If other people recognize it and send people to you for that. What are you known for? What's your specialty? That's a strength for you. And then satisfaction. What thing do you finish and you can't wait to do the next one? What project do you open up and you're like, yes, there's 14 different read books I have to build here. Or like, <laughs> oh my goodness, I get to write an entire communication plan. What is the thing that you're, you, you finish it and you're like, I cannot wait to do the next one. Because that's probably a strength for you. And you may notice there's a wide variety of different examples I just used. Those are not all me. In fact, if you try to make me do a research project, you're going to have to find me first. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. Again, I don't have to be good at everything. I don't have to be a well-rounded person. I need to understand that sometimes I'm going to have to do that. And I need to understand my people who love the research project. You can just call me. And fine, there you go. <laughs> Rachel, I have a research project, and then I won't even be able to find it anymore because she'll have taken it and run away. So, okay, why do my strengths matter? Why do we care? Why are we worried about these words and these things? This is not navel casing. This is not meant to be fun. This is not a BuzzFeed quiz where you use your favorite dessert and they tell you your movie boyfriend. We're <laughs> going to use this in practical life, okay? Your strengths don't just describe what you're good at. They influence your choices. If you have high communication, guess what you're going to do a lot of? Communicating. Real talking. Get loud talking. Guess what I have? Because communication is my number two. You're going to build a lot of slide decks. You're going to show up to people with an outline of things as opposed to someone who has very high input or intellection might, might do research before they start a plan. If you have high active error, you might have already started. without you, you forgot the thinking part. You just went. Your strengths, they direct your actions. They decide what you're going to do, and they filter your worldview. This is extremely important, especially for managers. We talked about this a little bit earlier, Ed, that if I'm a manager who, who for example, has high activator, I'm someone who just don't. I went like, uh, I don't even need the entire plan because I've already jumped. I've already started. Um, and you have someone who really prefers to do a lot of research and have all of the uh, T's crossed and the I's dotted and make sure they have a past use case and understanding why we're doing the things we're doing. You as the manager might be like, this person never starts. They never do anything. You know, also your employees like, look at him running off half-cocked. What is he doing? They filter your worldview. And your manager's worldview as an employee really influences your life, your quality of life. This, what you're good at, it's very easy for what you're good at to become what you value. I hire people who are like me. I know I can trust this person to get their work done. And why is that? Often when you look into it, it's because they get their work done the same way you get your work done. They create to-do lists. I create to-do lists. I know they're getting stuff done because I can see their to-do list. Well, the absence of a to-do list is not the lack of getting things done. It's not the same thing. It's all way of doing things, not the way. It can influence succession planning. How often have you looked upward in an organization and seen that the people getting promoted are a lot like the people who are already up there? And it's not always demographic, something you can see in someone's face. Sometimes it's about styles. It's about their own personal strengths and how they work. It can influence task assignments, and not in a good way. You would want someone who's naturally good at communication, who naturally enjoys communication, to write your communication for you. But if what you, are, if what you value is someone whom you know they can get their work done because you can see it in their to-do list, but they're not great at communication, you may be handing off communication tasks to that person even though they don't like it just because you feel you can trust them to do it. And then finally, leadership styles. I know for the FEDS scores for Army, one of the lowest sub-indices, leaders lead. This is something that y'all have rated yourselves very low on. So I want to ask, do we have leaders that aren't leading or do we have leaders that are leading in a way that doesn't resonate with the people who are supposed to be following? When you're the lead sled dog, part of your job is to look behind you and make sure all the other dogs are still attached, right? You can't just run off. The styles, a mismatch in styles can really make it feel like there's no one up front, there's no one leading you there. Can you elaborate a little bit more on maybe how we do some of these things in real life? Sure, sure. Well, I would definitely point you back to, um, to slide 16 of the looking at the clues to strength, like noticing these things in yourself, and also noticing them in your coworkers. So if you always point people who want uh, help designing the process to Jenny, tell Jenny that explicitly. Go up to her and be like, hey, I've noticed you're really good at designing processes. I just wanted to explicitly call that out for you. Tell Jenny's boss that she's really good at designing processes and you trust her and she's your go-to for that. Make your thought processes explicit. There are some things that I tell my people, and I'm going to go very much into Gallup's strengths words here, and I apologize for that. Input, people. Input is kind of a collection approach to knowledge, like an idea of magpie. I'm going to gather up all these little rocks of interesting facts, and I'm going to keep them here just in case someone might need them. 
ideas, input people are the people most likely to fall into Wikipedia rabbit holes. <laughs> but the beauty of input people is that they often know their greatest trivia. They often know that fact that someone needs to, if you go up to an input person and you're just kind of brainstorming, they'll be like, oh, wait, I actually just read an article on employee engagement and let me find it here. This will be interesting to you. They have the resource you need. So as an input person, if you make explicit to people that one of the things I do is I go down Wikipedia rabbit holes, I read a lot of journals, uh, I'm halfway through reading the fifth edition of war and methods of war. I, I read in the entirety of Sun Tzu. So if you need to talk about these things, I'm your girl. I'm excited about this. Tell people what information you're collecting right then. Make it explicit. If you're a person with high intellect and you're a thinker, you like to ponder, ask for time to ponder. Tell the people around you that you need time to think about things. Explicitly ask for what you need. If you're a person who is high woo, you need that constant input of new people. You need to meet new people. You need that influx of new personalities. Don't just seek it out for yourself. Make it explicit to the people around you that that's what you're looking for. I need you to introduce me to new people. I need you to help me find my new people. So look for your own clues. Ask for the things that you've noticed you like. Make explicit the things that are going on inside your head because they're not clear to everyone else. One of the keys to strengths of not just thinking about it, what you're good at, but Understanding that it's unique to you, that one in 33 million is that you are not a default human being from whom all other human beings vary. You are really odd and unique. And so is everyone else. <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 And it's okay. You are you. And you can't assume that the person you're talking to thinks the same way you do because I'm glad they don't. And I actually think that a, a lesson from my own life is noticing when people aren't following you, like oh, gosh. picking up on the, like, Maybe you're not exercising your strength to its fullest extent yeah. in that I have a friend who half the time, he knows me really, really well. And so he knows where my brain is bouncing off to when I'm like, oh, yeah. And then I read this other article and it's like in my head, Rachel has high input, by I've way. made 10 leaps in my head and everybody else is going, what is what she the talking, talking about? <laughs> like, where, where does she go? And I'm like, hi. Yeah. <laughs> there are things, if you are, if you love a brainstorm, if you're a natural, that's ideation in um, Gallup terms. If you love a brainstorm, one of the things that people who are really good at brainstorms do that other people don't necessarily do is to throw out ideas they're not married to. And it's important to make that explicit because as, a, as someone with high ideation, to say to people, hey, I'm just spitballing here. I don't care about any of these ideas. You're not going to hurt my feelings. It's okay to shoot me down. That's cool. Because for other people, often when they put out ideas, it is something that they care deeply about. And they do feel hurt when you mess it up. And you can steamroll them. Or like me, who puts out wrong answers on purpose just to see what people want to fight on. You know, like, I hate this idea, but go ahead and run with it. There we go. Yeah, yeah. you'll see what happens. <laughs> if you're, like, what Rachel was talking about, if you can see a million different plans and you can run way far ahead, you may have to show your work. Someone behind, someone may be like, I don't understand how this train got here. And I'm not with you, and I'm really confused and a little scared right now. You might well, I'm already making the decision. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I already started. Um, you may have to go back and be like, okay, so here's my chain of thought. Number one, you said employee engagement. And then I thought about this thing, and then I went over here, and I read this article, and then I think, so here is the case, and here's how it goes together, right? And <laughs> also, think about, <laughs> not, exactly. think about your partners, too, because you may be the Rachel who is bound to 100 different places. But do you have a friend like her friend who can go back and either say, like, you lost me, go back, or be like, okay, so am I drawing this chain right? A to B to C to G to F and R and back over to T? Is that where we are? And Rachel can be like, yes, check. So sometimes it can be helpful to have someone else describe your own question back to you. Okay, let's talk real people, real situations right here. All four of these people are in the room with me right now. These are Gallup terms. So, again, you may want to go back to that link that we provided in slide 14 that has descriptions for what all these strengths are if you have not taken the Gallup assessment. But I'm going to ask some questions and we're going to see if we can talk about what you might think from these people. So let's say you're in charge of this team. Let's say all these people work together in some sort of fictional war, like, I don't know, Army civilian workforce transformation. <laughs> and they work on the employee engagement. Oh, let's just say the employee engagement initiative. These are their strengths. These are their top five. Who would you go to if you want to understand what emotions there are? Rachel has empathy there at number three. Empathy is like a thermometer. Empathy can tell how people are feeling in the room. Who here makes sure that things get finished? Can I use the hammer? <laughs> the hammer. Gosh, responsibility. Remember that from earlier? Responsibility.
abilities, the psychological obligation to make sure things get done. I do the things I say I'm going to What's do. What's also a guilt thing? It is. <laughs> oh my God. Responsibility, responsibility is absolutely a guilt. Achiever might get things done because of the sheer joy of getting things done. Like, I made a to-do list and then I did a thing. That would be challenge. Jenny does things because if not, if she doesn't do them, the guilt eats her alive. She stays awake at night going, I didn't finish it. I didn't finish the thing. Even though the person who asked to do the thing is sleeping like a baby, totally fine, doesn't care. Jenny is eating herself alive on it. Okay, so who sees the long-term goal and make sure we are working toward that long-term goal? Strategic sees the paths to the future, that they see where we're going and how we can get there. Strategic is also really great at dropping paths that aren't going to work. And strategic is one of the ones where I often say, show your work, because it's extremely obvious to you. It's, it's, I, I have strategic at number one, so our brains work weird and you have to explain it to other people. So you may have to go back and be like, wait. Now luckily you also have analytical up there too, so you know exactly why it works. Unlike me where I'm like, I don't know. It's, I just can't explain work. why it works. Yes, but you'll really have to go back and tell everyone. Who provides and follows the structure? Which of these people do you look to to provide and follow the structure? Or to give it away, who don't you go to to provide and follow a structure? Discipline is a person who creates and follows a structure. Jalen, Jenny, and Ed all have discipline. I can tell you right now that these meetings are extremely well structured as someone who does not have high discipline. Discipline is a person who automatically creates a structure when they go into a situation. This is a person who shows up to a new team and says, well, what's your process to do this? And if you don't have a process, the, all the hairs on the back of their neck stand up. And they create a process if there isn't one already. I would say if you have this team at this is the team you're working with and you need a structure created, you should turn to one of the many people you have that create a structure and not try and make Rachel be someone she's not. All right. And finally, who can help people find agreement? Now, this is one of the Gallup strengths that actually the term is very similar to the meaning of the term in, you know, regular human English. Harmony. Harmony is finding agreement, smoothing over conflict, avoiding conflict. And again, often with harmony, it's not because they're afraid of conflict. It's not because conflict is scary. It's because it's unproductive and it takes time. So harmony is actually a strength that a lot of people use to get things done efficiently because they can help bring people to agreement. So Jalen is who you turn to for harmony to help bring people together on this team. Thank you, Mel. So let's talk about real positions. This is a real position. It is out right now on the USA Jobs. Now, normally we would look at this and say, okay, we need an HR specialist. It says right there, right? But if a resume has made it to your desk and actually made it through the process that is USA Jobs, this person is a human resources specialist. Right. They're qualified. Right. So if we're looking at this from a strengths perspective, what are the qualities of the person that we actually need? Who is going to be successful in this job? Which in human resource specialist? Yes. yes. Which Because human resource specialist is, at this point, no longer a useful distinguisher. Correct. That's everyone. That's all the people on your desk. All right. If you wouldn't mind going on, I've highlighted some words here. We're not talking about just someone who's a human resources specialist. We're talking about the specific responsibilities that this job will have. This person has to advise managers. So... We're not just talking about understanding what the rules and procedures are. We're talking about both being able to advise people on them, so make decisions based on those rules and procedures, but also explain them if you see the second circle. So this is someone who needs to be able to translate from HR speak, which they're fluent in as an HR specialist, to regular human English that the manager or the uh, employees might speak. They need to be able to conduct studies. So this isn't just about interpersonal relations. This isn't just about translating and speaking and explaining. This is also about research, being able to develop manage, management interests and respond to union interests. They're going to have to be able to gather data, sort through the data, come up with conclusions based on the data. This is someone who needs to be pretty comfortable with a spreadsheet, I would say. And finally, they need to be able to serve as a spokesperson. So this isn't just someone who can explain. This isn't someone who's just a puppet, uh, puppet master behind the scenes. This is someone who needs to be comfortable in front of the camera for this value of the camera, in front of management, in front of the negotiating committee, in front of employees serving as a spokesperson for HR rules and regulations. So if you're looking at those kinds of things, you might be asking yourself, well, what can I do with that? Like, the job is the job, it's already posted. Well, those are questions you can ask in the interview, and I understand you have to ask the same questions in the same order to every single person. I have been in front of a government panel before. But you can tailor those questions that you ask. You can choose the questions, and you can choose them to help you distinguish whether your candidates 
have these kinds of qualifications. You can look in the KSAs, you can look at cover letters, if they wrote them, to see whether the person can demonstrate that they have these kinds of qualities. What kinds of questions would you ask? So I would say, uh, for example, tell me about a time where you had to translate from technical or rural speech to uh, more layman speech to, for a non-expert audience. That would be something I would ask to get at, whether they can explain rules and procedures. I would ask about a time when they researched, they had to do a research or a study to come up with an answer to a question. I would probably, for this one, ask, tell, tell me about a time where you were a spokesperson or a liaison or the face of an organization or a, a rule set. Thank you. Now, this is the Gallup format. Name it, claim it, and aim it. What they want you to be able to do is name what you're good at. Tell other people. Be able to describe it to other people. And in doing so, you claim it. You take responsibility. You take ownership. I am a person with high harmony. I'm good at bringing people to agreement. I am an activator. I'm someone who has that oomph to make people go and get started. I am high discipline. I'm someone who provides structure and order. And by claiming those things, you take the responsibility for developing those things. We talked already about how the formula, how the things you're naturally good at are the things you're naturally good at, but they don't really become strengths until you practice them, until you develop them, until you learn more about them and exercise them again and again like your muscles. And that's why the slide's titled No Excuses. Because we're not saying, we, we don't want anyone to look at strengths and go, oh, well, I'm not naturally good at empathy, so I guess, like, I'm just going to leave broken hearts and stampeded egos <laughs> behind me everywhere I go, like some sort of human bulldozer. That's not what we're saying, and there's actually no excuse. Just because you're not good at something naturally doesn't mean you have to be terrible at it and you have to destroy other people. Right, going through. and just because I don't have discipline doesn't mean that right. I get out of building any sort of structure right. or following the structure, right? And just and I, I like rules. I have very strong feelings about rules. <laughs> I really do. And I actually, I'm quite sure where that comes from. I have consistency at number 34. Consistency is the idea that rules are important and that the best way to treat people fairly is to treat them the same. And that is something that is completely anathema to me. That is not how I feel at all. And yet I've never been fired. I've never been arrested. I'm perfectly capable of following the rules. Um, and what I do when I have to deal directly with rules is bring in people who have that natural innate understanding of why rules are important to help guide me through which rules are set in stone, which rules are bendable, what the reasons are behind the rules, because I do a lot better with reasons than rules. So this is what we're talking about with claiming. You have a responsibility to be the best possible version of yourself, to develop your own self. And I understand that in the government, sometimes it's hard to get that promotion and sometimes it's hard to get that other position. But that doesn't mean that you can't get better. That doesn't mean that you can't grow and develop yourself as a person because it, it's not tied to what you do. It's who you are. And then the final step of Gallup's process is aim it. So we're talking about taking your strengths and pointing them directly at whatever it is you're trying to do. And it's fine, whatever the thing is that you're trying to accomplish. One of the things they did um, as an example of this in my class where I learned to become a Gallup strengths coach, they had us all write down the same goal. Become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach by whatever the date was that I don't remember anymore. And then they had us name some of our strengths at the top and talk about behaviors we exhibited as part of those strengths and turn those into tasks we could do in order to accomplish that goal, become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach by some date that exists. So for the mind was strategic. I make good plans. I know the best paths to take. Activator is that I go, I start, I, I do things, and positivity, I'm excited, I have uh, energy, I get people moving, I get things going. And then I wrote out my, my tasks that I would do, how I would accomplish that goal. Like, I'm not going to wait to develop a study plan, I'm just going to pick a study plan, because it almost doesn't matter which one I pick, I'm just going to go. I made a plan that would work for me. And at the end of that 10-minute exercise, I was really confident that I personally was going to become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach by whatever the date is, which I did, go me. But I was a little worried about everyone else in the classroom because they didn't have my strengths and I didn't see how they were possibly going to get to this goal. And that's what making a goal, aiming yourself based on your strengths, can do. It's not a plan that works for somebody. It's not a plan that works for anybody. It's a plan that works for you. But since you're the one who's executing it, that's who it needs to work for. We want to end on something you've already seen so that you have the chance to actually listen and absorb and not just read. You don't have to be a different person than who you are to be successful. There is no magic formula. There is no strength or set of strengths or combination of strengths that connects to any work role or level of success or human type. There's nothing you have to be 
to be successful. You can be who you are and be successful. You don't have to be all things to all people. That well-rounded person that you want to be that you have in your head, let go of that because that person is fake. There is no well-rounded person. You heard it here first. You don't have to be all things to all people. What you do have to be is yourself. You can't be anything you want to be. Sorry, your, your parents lied. But you can do anything you want to do. You can be more of who you are and you can get where you're going based on who you already are with what you've got already. And finally, if you can't be anything but what you are, if you don't have to become a different person to be successful, why wouldn't you want to be the best possible version of yourself? You can be better no matter what job you're in, no matter how hard it is to get that promotion, no matter what position you end up moving to next. You can be a better version of yourself. You can continue to grow. That's the end of our presentation. We've got some resources for you. If you're interested in learning more about these things, StrengthsFinder 2.0 is actually the basis for a lot of the strength stuff we've discussed. And with every purchase of this book, actually, you get a code to take the assessment, which will help you learn your top five strengths. This book is fascinating. It has basic descriptions of all of the different strengths. And if you're like me, um, which as we know, the odds are that you're not, but <laughs> if we share some of these, if we share some some of our specific behaviors, you'll find yourself reading through the basic descriptions of strengths and going, oh my God, that's totally Rachel. Or like, oh, look at this. This one is absolutely Jenny. Like, I cannot believe that. Some of them you can just, you're reading it and you're like, that's my mom. That's exactly what she's like. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can help you understand how other people think. And then also, It's the Manager is one of the newest books by Gallup. This is where we got the statistic that 70% of variance in employee engagement scores can be attributed to the manager, which I find fascinating. So this book is not meant to be read through cover to cover. It's meant to be picked through based on what is interesting to you and what you need at the time. But the idea is that a manager, a first-line supervisor who deals with both directly with employees that have no supervisory responsibilities and with upper-level leadership, that person is the lever on which the world turns. That person is the fulcrum that can change the earth because they have so much power, but they also have so much put on them. So I would highly recommend this one. It's the manager if you are looking to change your organization. And if you're a manager, look at what you've got. Look at the, the possibility that is within you and think about it. Read it from a perspective of what do I need to do a good job. Also, this also includes a code for Clifton Strengths Assessment, which uh, someone had to point out to me afterwards. I, I got this book and I was gleefully running through it and didn't realize that I had gotten a code, which I gave to Jalen. So if you're interested in taking the assessment, don't feel like you have to take Strengths 2.0. If you'd rather read it to the manager, there's also a code in there. All right. Thank you, Mel. And thank you, everybody in the room, thank for uh, being with us today and sharing your thoughts. For those of you listening, thank you for your time. And we are more than happy to talk with you afterwards. If you would like more information on Strengths, if you have comments that you'd like to share, questions that you would like answered, please feel free to reach out to Mel and I at, at the address here, engagement at lmi.org, and we will gleefully respond. <laughs> we both have high positivity, so we'll yeah. literally be gleeful. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, and this concludes our presentation.